Well, hello, good morning. Uh, if I've never met you, my name's Dave, and I sneak in here every once in a while from Kentucky. It's great to be back with you all at CCV, and whether you are here at a campus or you're joining us online, uh, welcome. I'm glad you're part of this worship experience. Back in January of 1981, Ronald Reagan was the new incoming president. Michael Deaver served at that time as the deputy chief of staff during the Reagan administration. And on the morning of President Reagan's inauguration, Deaver became concerned because it appeared that his boss had overslept. And so he gently knocked on the president's bedroom door and cracked the door a bit and said, sir, it's 8.30 in the morning. In about two hours, you are going to be sworn in as the 40th president of the United States of America. And Deaver said that Reagan stuck his head out and groggily looked back at him from under the covers and said, do I have to? (laughs) You ever feel like that? You ever feel like the burden of leadership is just too much for you to bear at work or at home or maybe even here at church? Uh, Today we, we continue our Lead Like Jesus series and I've loved this entire series. I've listed every one of these messages Uh, the heart, the hands, the head of the leader. And today we're going to look at the habits that a leader has as we try to lead like Jesus. And healthy habits make leadership bearable for us. It's the salesperson who gets in the self-imposed discipline of writing five personal notes each week to keep his name in, in front of clients. It's the department manager who learns how to delegate responsibilities. It's the public school teacher who comes in early and has some some music playing or some coffee brewing just to make it a welcoming environment for a teenager. And small habits you employ and disciplines that you develop can help you excel as a leader. And when I say that word habit, I want you to picture in your mind uh, a pulley A pulley system can enable you to lift and bear a weight that you otherwise couldn't lift. I mean, think of how the the pyramids were, were built centuries ago, or think of the massive stones that were moved to build the temple in Jerusalem. How do they move those heavy, large stones? Well, they, they use pulleys. And when a second pulley was brought in, it it, it cut the load in half, and, and another additional pulley would be brought in, and it would exponentially increase the load that you were able to lift, and it shared the load, and it distributed it evenly, and it allowed you to do more than you thought was ever possible. So think of it this way. With each healthy habit, it enables you to lift far more than you thought that you could bear. Healthy habits serve as pulleys to lighten your load and increase your leadership capacity. And Ashley has talked throughout this series about how it is that that leadership is influence and influence is leadership. And we are all leaders, every single one of us. And with that in mind, I wanna share three habits that I think will be the most beneficial for you. And these habits have allowed me to bear far more than I ever could without them. And I think they'll do the same in your life as well. Here's, here's the first one. Exceptional leaders continually model humility. Now, this is an ongoing battle. You don't reach a point where you suddenly master humility, and from that point on, pride is no longer a temptation. My mom used to, to say, humility is like underwear. You need to have it, but don't call attention to it. Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 2, he says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Solomon doesn't say if pride comes, he says when pride comes, because we are constantly in a battle with the flesh to elevate and think more highly of ourselves, and that's why you have to deliberately model humility. And humility can be difficult to navigate because we often see those who rise to the top of leadership being pompous or being proud, being entitled or or condescending. And, And some leaders think that they must always exude confidence. And some people mistakenly think that humility is a sign of weakness. And yet survey after survey shows that employees consistently say that humility 
is a much more important value and attribute than that of confidence. And that authenticity is always more attractive than arrogance. The Apostle Paul was a significant leader in the days of the early church, and he talks in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 about a thorn in the flesh. And, and by that term, he, he's just talking about a personal struggle or a challenge that he felt that weakened his leadership. And so Paul prayed that God would remove that from him. But I want you to see what God's response was in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. Paul writes, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. We all have weaknesses. So why not admit them rather than pretending that they don't exist? Can I tell you about my lowest leadership valley? It was back in 2006 and during my first year as the senior pastor of, of Southeast Christian Church in, in Louisville. And I had waited for this to come and my predecessor did a great job of setting me up for it to be a successful transition. And things went smoothly at first, but I was inheriting a situation where everything was really good. For the past 39 out of 40 years, the church had grown. And then in my first year, we went from 18,000 in attendance down to 17,000. Yeah, that's, a, that's a real self-confidence booster, right? Uh, hey, Dave, way to go. You solved the parking problem. Uh, <laughs> so it was, a, it was a very dark season for me to have this church going so well, and then when I take over the lead, it, it takes a step backwards. And for the very first time in my entire life, I walked into the office each day and I didn't enjoy my job. I had looked forward to this role for years, but I found that, that when you get to that role, it can be a very lonely role. Early on during that stretch, I told my wife I was, I was planning to, to buy a glass container and fill it up with 500 marbles, and each day when I would come into work, I would just remove one of those marbles, and then in a year and a half, when I had lost my marbles, I would just quietly resign knowing that I had given it my best and that I'd hung in there longer than I thought I could. Our church is located along a major interstate and it's quite visible to everyone as they drive past and I began to notice that during that first year that when I would glance over at the church, it would make me sick at my stomach. And that had never happened before in the previous 17 years, so, so why now? What changed? Well, prior to that leadership transition, every time I drove past it, I found relief that there was always someone that was above me on the org chart, on the organizational chart. I found relief in that the, the buck stopped with the senior pastor, and I concluded that he was the one at the top, so he bore all of that heavy load. But now, since assuming that leadership role, leading over 400 staff members and thousands of members, I felt that weight. And instead of relying on some pulleys, I looked inward instead of outward. I looked inward instead of upward. And when I looked inward, I saw my inadequacies. You see, in my pride, I was leading out of fear rather than out of faith. And it took about a year of just my wife praying for me and deep, intense prayer on my part. And I finally, I eventually learned what should have been obvious to me all along. And I discovered that at my church, there was someone higher on the org chart. There's someone who has more authority than the box that says lead pastor. In fact, he purchased the church with his own blood. Listen to me, in your workplace, you may be at the top of the food chain, you may be the big cheese, the head honcho, the top dog, the big kahuna, but may I lovingly remind you that there is still another layer above you 
on the big org chart. You say, well, Dave, I, you, don't, you don't understand. I don't, I don't work at a church. I don't work at a Christian ministry. I, I lead a team in the secular world. I, I, I'm uh, in marketplace. Well, just remember what Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. It is the Lord Christ that you are serving. And if you model humility and you partner with God, that habit will become like a pulley to help bear the load and carry the weight of leadership. But if you try to do it on your own, or if you think you don't need the Lord, eventually your leadership will suffer. When you mesh pride with power, it becomes as potent as poison. Someone said it like this, power is a lot like alcohol. The faster you consume it, the more quickly it goes to your head. But humble leaders, when you admit your weaknesses and your blind spots, that's when God comes alongside of you and does his best work, not because of you, but in spite of you. Well, here's a second pulley to empower your leadership, and that is exceptional leaders learn how to handle criticism. If you lead even a handful of people, you will always have those who disagree. There will always be anonymous letters. There will always be social media comments from people who disagree with you or have a differing opinion. Listen to these words of wisdom in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. And in my over 35 years of, of ministry, I've, I have received a, a lot of criticism, and uh, a lot of it has been deserved. But here's some things that I've learned about handling criticism. The first thing I try to do is I try to, when I receive it, I try to sit on it for a day so that I don't just respond in anger. And then I try to look for any truth that's in the criticism. Is there something that I need to own out of this? Is there, is there something that I need to say, you're, you're right on this? And then I try to share from my perspective where I'm coming from, why I did this or why I said that, what my rationale was. And then I, uh, if I choose to reply back to them or, or to talk with them about it, once I've done that, I just put it in the rearview mirror and I drive on. Because you can't please everyone. And I don't always respond to those things because sometimes it's not worth the time. If Ashley responded to every email or phone call that he gets on every decision, he would never have time to write a sermon. There's over 30,000 different opinions on every issue when it comes to life these days. But it's not always easy to know whether or not to respond. Years ago, on my first couple of times that I spoke here at CCV, uh, I made some jokes uh, about me being from Kentucky, and I told some stereotypical uh, comments ab ab about us and, and, and called us hillbillies and some different things. And the next week, I got an email forwarded to me from someone uh, out here in the Phoenix area who had moved from Kentucky. And they said, please don't tell those jokes. You're making things more difficult for us because in Arizona, people already literally think that everybody back home is toothless and barefoot. They wrote, don't make it any tougher than it already is. But here's the thing. The, the person was very serious. Now, do I just absorb that or do I respond to that? Do I worry and, and fret over that? Do I get my laptop out and say, oh, I am so sorry that my exaggerated comments offended you. The intent of my self-deprecating humor was not to make your life more difficult than it is. In the future, I will be more sensitive to the feelings of those who have moved out west from the rural states. <laughs> now, now as a leader do I take 15 minutes to respond to that is that the best use of my time or do I just, just let that go and I, I prayed about it and I decided it's not, it's not the best use of my time it's not worth it because if I wrote back and explained myself to that former Kentuckian then they would have to find a friend who knows how to read and um, 
I am so sorry. <laughs> I don't know where the line is, but I just crossed it, I'm sure. <laughs> but it's not worth all that time, is my point, right? <laughs> here's, here's what I'm saying. Choose your battles wisely. We've been talking in the series about how Jesus is the, is the ultimate example when it comes to leadership, and Jesus was the ultimate example when it came to criticism as well. He, he, he knew whether to respond or whether to absorb it. In some settings, when he was being trapped by people with some questions, he would use his knowledge to answer them or to reply back with a tougher question of his own. And other times, he would just allow people to take their shots because they didn't understand the difference he was talking about between a political kingdom and a heavenly kingdom. Think back to the previous sermon series a month or so ago, don't take the bait, all right? There's a pretty tense setting, though, that takes place in Mark chapter 15, and at one time, Jesus answers Pilate, and another time, Jesus doesn't answer Pilate. Look at Mark chapter 15, verses one and two. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews, asked Pilate? You have said so, Jesus replied. Why does he respond then? Well, if he didn't respond, he would be denying his very own deity. And so he speaks up and he affirms that he is the king of the Jews. After all, he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the Bible tells us. Look at verses three and five, and let's see what happens in the next exchange. The chief priests accused him of many things, and Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. Why doesn't Jesus take the bait? Well, it's because Jesus knows that if he opens his mouth, it would be very easy for him to answer the charges and give a perfectly reasonable counter argument and, and he could systematically have every charge dropped. You see, sometimes leaders remain silent and absorb the criticism in order to advance the mission. And so Jesus silently allows evil to take its course all the way to the cross. Why? Well, what did Mark Moore tell us last week? He said that Jesus' mission, the reason Jesus came to earth was to save people from their sin. So Jesus remains silent for you and for me. And what I'm saying is there are times in the break room, there are times at the family reunion, when as a Christian you accept and endure the persecution and the ridicule. And you'll have to prayerfully decide when to defend and when to deflect. But the Holy Spirit will let you know that. And in our society, we've come to think that silence is cowardly. Often today, people say that silence is complicity. But I've found that when I'm quick to speak, I'm, I'm quick to misspeak. You ever been there? Hmm. Maybe that's why the scripture says, be slow to speak. Sometimes, as a leader, you respond to criticism, and other times, you, you just absorb it. But it's not always easy to, to take the high road. We have a four-year-old grandson. His, his name is Bauer, and Bauer recently started going to preschool for a few hours a, a couple of days a week. And one of the boys in his class has been pretty mean to a number of the kids in the class. And I'm sure that for some reason, the kid is just acting out, or he's hungry for attention in any way he can get it. And a couple of different times, he has, he has picked on uh, Bauer. Now, this is, this is Bauer, all right? How can you pick on that dude, right? I mean, look at that kid. How, what would make a person pick on Bauer? And so my daughter, Savannah, has been coaching Bauer on how to react uh, when he comes in contact uh, with this um, uh, juvenile delinquent. And... <laughs> And my daughter, Savannah, has been saying, now, Bauer, here's what I want to happen. When, when he says something mean to you, he says, I, I, I want, she says, I want you to find something nice that you can say about him. I want you to find something that's encouraging that you can say about him. And so you find something positive that you can say. And so he went off to school the next day, and 
After he came back from school, she picked him up and she saw him and said, how did it go today? Was he nice to you or, or was he mean to you? And uh, he said, mommy, he was mean to me. She said, did you, did you kill him with kindness? What did he say? He said, well, he walked across the room and he came over to me and he said, you're a dummy. And she said, I'm so sorry, buddy. What did you say back to him? He said, well, I looked him over and I said, I like your shoes. And that was it. He said, and I just kept saying to him, I like your shoes, I like your shoes, I like your shoes. And finally he walked away. So evidently he didn't know how to handle a compliment and that had never come his direction before. Ever since that happened, uh, now whenever I say something that I shouldn't to my wife, my wife will say, I like your shoes. <laughs> and I know what she's meaning, right? Not every relationship will always go super smoothly for you. There are people who know how to push your buttons, and sometimes their critical words are meant to detour or, or distract you from, from your mission. But you, you take the high road, and you say, I like your shoes, and then shake the dust off of yours and continue to move on and to press on and to lead Here's the third and final pulley to empower your leadership, and it's, it's simply this. Exceptional leaders let God lead them. And this is a great discipline to develop, and, and it's one of the toughest parts of being a, a leader. And, and I talked about it a little bit earlier, and that is that the, the higher you go in an organization, the lonelier you can become. But what if you allowed any loneliness in your leadership role to propel you into a partnership with God? I mean, after all, he's the one who put you in that role in the first place. And whether the sphere of your influence is, is big or small, God is the one who has the ability to expand or decrease your territory. I've loved this series, and part of the reason I've loved it is because of the different interviews throughout this series. And it's just regular people. It's CCV members, all having different types of of groups that they influence. They all share something in common though. They all look to Jesus as the ultimate leadership example. I want you to watch this video with Jim Younger right now. Watch this with me. Jim, thanks for being with us. And for those that don't know you, give us a, give us a quick introduction. I'm a founding member at CCV. I'm in the construction business. Um, I've been in the construction business. I started the business in 1976. I've seen a lot of cycles. At the peak of the business, we had over 2,000 employees. Um, in the last 10 years, we've been in the top 10 privately owned family businesses uh, in Arizona. Jim, first of all, thank you for being a founding member. There's not many people at our church that have seen what you've seen, how God's moved to CCB, so thank you for all that you've done. You've been leading for almost more years than I've been alive. And wow, yet, that's dating me a lot. Uh, <laughs> but you're, you're just, you're really this experienced leader. That's been doing it for a long time, but one of the things I've observed about you is you, you always have this humility about you of always wanting to get better. And I, I wanna talk about that because I feel like the, the gravitational pull of leadership is you lead to a certain point where you think, I have it all done, but you're continually, you have this habit of inviting these consultants and other people to come in and tell you, what, what can I do to be better? Mm -hmm. what, what drives that in you? You know, if, if, if I learn and grow, I care about my people enough to invest into learning and growth, then I can have the opportunity to bring them along with me mm -hmm. and that they can learn and grow. And I mean, in the end, this whole thing, it's, it's about the contribution that we made, yeah. not how big the business is or how successful the business yeah. is or was. It's about, did we make a difference? Yeah. You know? That's good. How much do you think that the, what you learned to develop in that 1987 crash helped create in you some habits and some values that helped you be resilient during the crashes that are to come. I mean, mm -hmm. we're, we're right in the middle of, of a very much an economic uncertain time right now. You know, certain industries are hit worse than others, but do you, how much do you think that really prepared you? Parts of that were pretty painful. So I remember um, going, looking for a quiet place, trying to get away from all the noise. And then, you know, quieting my 
you know, my mind, you know, trying to make my heart still so I could hear God. Mm. You know, I would, uh, I, I, and I wrote this down. It's like when we concentrate and meditate on God's work, we can have an understanding that goes beyond our human capability. Mm. And uh, so, I, I, you know, I really learned to lean on God a lot more. Mm. I had nowhere else to go. Yeah. It felt like I had nowhere else yeah. to go. How has your how has your faith as a follower of Jesus helped make you a better leader or just inform your leadership style? Well, I think I think that's it. You know, this um, this dichotomy between God and ego. So, um, how do I keep my ego out of this? You know, and it's oh. by having this con communication with God. You know, um, this this constant relationship with God um, that keeps the me out of it yeah. and kind of keeps me centered. Yeah. Of all the habits you've had to learn as a leader, which one's been hardest to incorporate in your life? I would say that I've always been a learner, but up until maybe in my 40s, you know, maybe around that time with Shay, um, it was more of a learner in the School of Hard Knocks. I've probably oh. got a master's there, maybe it, maybe even a doctorate by now in the School of Hard Knocks. Yeah. When I got intentional about learning, mm. and, and it, I read, you get a hunger for it, and you're consistent about learning. There's, there's just a wealth of great knowledge out there, a wealth of information about how to be a better businessman, how to be a better leader. And then when I learned to be able to put that in application too. So it's like, if I, if I read something, I want to pick one or two things out of that book, put them into application right away. There you go. You know, because the knowledge without the application isn't, isn't enough either. So Love we're that. going to try it. Love that. Jim, what's, what's one leadership habit that you will do every day without fail? I read every day, every morning. I meditate on God's Word, and I read something of significance every day. Wow. That's... I don't... I don't absorb a whole book sometimes it might be just uh just a chapter yeah or or, or something maybe it's something that i'm you know it, it's also maybe something that i get on a on a good video youtube video but it's yeah. usually something that i i i try to do something read something of significance something that's going to help me something i you know learn yeah from my my guess is some days you think eh, i didn't i don't know if i got that much out of it but it's the multiplication effect of every single day 365 days a year, I mean, that's going to transform your life. God's Word every day, learning something about leadership every day. I can't think of a better habit for every leader to have. That's inspiring. Mm -hmm. Jim, thanks for coming in and spending some time with us. I know it's made an impact on me, and I bet you it's making an impact on a lot of us. Well, I've enjoyed it, too. Thanks for having me. Great. Thank you, Jim. Uh, great words that tie in, did you notice this, with each pulley that we've talked about, about modeling humility. Uh, Jim actually invites critique in uh, to his life so that he can improve as a leader. And then that third pulley of being led by, by God by reading his word. And those are healthy habits being lived out in Jim's everyday life, and they're the same things that can take place in your life too, and in your family, and with your staff, and with your friends. But I want to invite you to focus in on that last part that Jim talked about, about regularly going back to the Bible for guidance. This is how we let God lead us. My friend back in, in Kentucky, Ashley Weiss, says it like this. She says, the leader who advances in the future is the one who retreats to God's word. And the Bible contains practical leadership suggestions and, and it helps us when we're in our lowest valley. It also has the words of eternal life. But when you read this book, it will enable you to recognize his voice and his promptings. So spend time in his word and in prayer and make certain that you are both talking to God and you are listening to God. Psalm chapter 46, verse 10 says, he, he says, be still and know that I am God. And it's tough to let God lead you if you aren't listening to him. Beth and I have a friend named Hannah. She's in her 20s and lives in Nashville. And prior to all of the COVID crisis, she was about to get on a, a flight and 
she was in the gate area and she was just praying about how it is that God might want to use her. And so she was trying to be open to whatever God might lay on her heart and she felt like God was impressing upon her that, that she was supposed to share some words of spiritual encouragement with whoever sat next to her on the plane. Well, she got on the plane, no one sat next to her. The last person to come in on the plane was a gal with bright blue hair and she came walking down the aisle and she took a seat right next to Hannah and you could tell that she was kind of mad at the world and her disposition showed that she didn't want anybody talking to her. And Hannah was like, really, Lord? <laughs> but after they took off, she decided that she would be obedient to follow through on what she had prayed earlier. And she struck up a conversation with the gal. And this is what she said. She said, I, I am fascinated by your hair because she truly was. She said, can you tell me how you arrived at the different colors and the shades that you chose? And the girl began to warm up to her and she began to open up and she began to share her life story with Hannah throughout that flight. And she uncrossed her arms and it was like her entire demeanor changed. Hannah learned that, that she was going through a divorce at that time. She had a four-year-old that was back at home staying with some friends, and, and she was on this flight, and she said, the reason that I'm, I'm going here is I'm going back home to decide whether or not I need to try to move back home. You see, I've, I've made some mistakes, and uh, my parents and I have had some conflict in the past, and she said, I'm up a creek now, and I, I don't know if they'll take me back. And Hannah said that she looked at her and, and she said, well, you, you need to have a spirit of humility and God wants to make certain that you have a repentant heart. And the whole time they were talking, Hannah told us that she felt like God was just impressing upon her. Say to her, Jeremiah 29, 11. Say to her, Jeremiah 29, 11. And Hannah said, I just resisted that thinking, oh no, that's just a scripture verse that everybody says. And they, they kind of use it out of context. And I, I don't want to share that with her. So she's having this debate with God the whole time she is listening to this young mom. And finally, as she listened and she couldn't put it off any longer, reluctantly, Hannah said to the girl, she said, you know that God has plans for you. She said, in the Bible, there's a verse, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. She says, it says, God has plans for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope to give you a future. And Hannah said that immediately when she shared that verse, this girl began crying. She began bawling like a baby. And Hannah quickly said, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry if I said something to offend you. I'm so sorry if I bothered you in some way. And the girl said, I, I know that verse. A godly relative of mine used to quote that to me at a very early age. And then she added, I'm crying. Because before I got on this flight, I prayed to God that if he truly was up there, that he would have somebody specifically say to me, Jeremiah 29, 11, and she said, if that happened, then I would know that I was supposed to go ask my parents if I could come back home. I share that story with you because I'm telling you, in your leadership, in your sphere of influence, God wants to use you. The Holy Spirit wants to use you to bring peace into the lives of those who don't have peace and hope to those who are hopeless. And when the Lord speaks and leads, the question becomes, will you listen and will you obey? Is there a name that comes to your mind right now? Is there someone that you need to speak words of life, words of encouragement, words of hope? Maybe you've brushed it off in the past. Maybe you've turned a deaf ear toward the voice of God. But here's my closing challenge for you. Write down the names of a couple of people who you need to spiritually encourage. And then this week, follow through and do it. Maybe it's a text, maybe it's an email, maybe it's a phone call, but you do something to reach out to them and follow through. Because God might be using a prompting that he lays on your heart right now or in the hours to come that will fulfill the prayer that someone else is offering. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you, uh, 
You say in your word that you wanna be that pulley for us, that you wanna bear that weight. Say, come, come to me, all you who are weary and, and burdened, and I will give you rest. And so, Lord, the weight of our leadership responsibility, whether it's a, a single mom with two kids, whether it's a, a middle manager, whether it's a CEO, whether it's a coach of a ball team, Lord, would you help us to lead one person at a time? And when we share that load with you, Lord, and when we partner with you, will you do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine? It's in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.